if you said the practice should be allowed, right, and the women wanted to kill themselves, then you're effectively speaking for her again, right? The point is, no one in power, no one in power ever considered asking the woman herself. Right? I'm generalizing a lot, but just so that you get the visual, right? No one in power, in a position of power, actually took it upon themselves to go to the individual woman um, at the point of sacrificing herself on the pyre to ask her whether or not she wanted to do it. Obviously, what would have happened is you would have had um, you would have had you would have had a variety of responses. What Spivak says is that all of these, this, this, and this, all of these options essentialize, essentialize the woman's voice. All of the options from the British essentialize the woman's voice in saying that um, none of us wanted to do this. I'm generalizing here, but none of us ever wanted to do this, and we're so glad you saved us, right? Thank you for saving us because none of us wanted to do this. The other extreme is to say that we all wanted to do this, and we don't need you telling us what to do. The truth is, um, and this is the genius of the, the, the argument, the truth is is that no, there is going to be a heterogeneous response to the question. Some women will freely want to um, um, uh, sacrifice themselves for their husbands in the act of devotion. Spivak talks about a few instances where men did it, um, but there will be women who willingly want to sacrifice themselves in an act of devotion. There are problems with that anyway because even the act is precipitated by the practice, but I'm not going to get into that now. So there will be some women who do want to do it. There will be some women who don't do it but are, in a sense, um, conceptually forced into the act. What ends up happening is that everyone essentializes the voice of the woman. We can, we can talk for her. Right? So this is, this is the, I, sort of, in the, in, the, in, the, in the West, this is like the quiet, um, what do you call it? Um, sh trophy wife. Right? This is the idea of like the trophy wife. The trophy wife doesn't have any brains, just be quiet. She's just there to look pretty. She's just there to compliment me as a man and my position of power. I need a beautiful woman on my arm that everybody else wants because that validates my power, right? I'm, I'm less powerful if my wife is not pretty then. So I need the prettiest thing there, not because she's of any intrinsic value in herself or I'm interested in her at all, but she legitimizes my power because, wow, he must be a powerful guy. Look at the wife he's got. She's beautiful, right? So what ends up happening is all stances, the hegemonic discourse, the, the British colonial masters, and the indigenous population have all essentialized the voice of the woman and no one has allowed her to speak for herself. More so, no one has given her a condition, the possibility, created the structure in which, and it, I mean, even this is ridiculous because you'd have to give it to her, right? No one's, there is no structure in which she has an ability to speak for herself. So. Um, the conclusion is, and this is what Spivak says, the subaltern cannot speak, right? So the subaltern do not have a voice, according to Spivak in this article. There is no virtue in global laundry list of women as pious items. And basically that, what that means is there is no glory, there is no honor in going through a list of hundreds and hundreds of names of women who have sacrificed themselves in the name of devotion, right? There is no honor in that. Um, representation has not withered away. Right? This is important. Representation has not withered away. That's sort of her structuralist claim. Right? Structuralism, uh, I might be pushing a little far. I don't know if, if she would necessarily say that, but it, it definitely can be interpreted in that sense that there is still um, a stronghold. There is still room for structuralist conceptions, meaning there's still room in which um, we can discuss um, the opacity the dislocation of subjectivity insofar as there is a signifier signified relationship, right? You cannot conflate the signifier and signified and say that we have access to the totality because it's far more complicated than that. The female intellectual as intellectual has a circumscribed task which she must not um, disown with a flourish, right? There's a, she, she ends the last sentence, which is classic. She ends with sort of a call to action, if you will. Scholars, young women scholars, as intellectuals, you have an obligation not to, um, not to disown um, your subjectivity, your identity, have your voice heard. So, with respect to um, subaltern studies and subaltern, subaltern uh, identity, we recognize that this really is 
an example of the sub it's a great example of the subaltern, right? Because we recognize that there is no voice to be had. Two options, both options are exhausted. Neither of the options um, um, were arrived at through sort of consultation. That would be laughable. That would there is no consultation. Both options essentialize the voice of the woman as as object, as thing to be sort of interacted with, rather than a recognition that the, that woman um, is a holistic, complex, um, dislocated um, um, identity that requires that requires right. This identity requires consultation. Requires. Um, recognition. But what ends up happening is in the larger economic structure, or legalistic structure, in the lar larger structure, and this is where the whole geopolitical um, discontinuity comes in, um, her voice, if it were legitimized and recognized, undermines or would slow down or complicate the progressive amassment of value within the capitalistic system, right? So it's not necessarily the case that it's just the you know, it's just easily an indictment of capital. It's not that simple. But what it is, it's, it's a recognition that if we legitimize the voice of our laborer, and we allow, and this is common sense if you think of it in this sense, right? If we legitimize the voice of our laborer, and we allow our laborers to think that they actually have power, then insofar as they have, they think that they have power, they might be able to use that power against the value that's inherent not inherent, that value that um, has been created under this capital system. So in the U.S., what ends up happening in the last month or so, um, the discourse on um, the unions and the fact that unions have been sort of outlawed and stripped and unions no longer have negotiation power. Well, because if the labor force thinks that they actually have power, then they're going to use unions to, um, to negotiate better states of affairs. If we legitimize the voice of the woman, right, if we recognize the voice of the woman, insofar as we even merely recognize the voice, we legitimize the act, right? So there is there is no recognition at all. We have to cre create uh, the preserve the population of subaltern women, subaltern third world women, and as the colonial overlords, we speak on their behalf. As the native population, we speak on their behalf. She's not allowed to speak. She's spoken for. Um, and that's the gist of it. Again, a um, whole bunch of stuff that was um, that I can't. I just I can't cover. It would it be its own you know 50, 60 part video series, and I don't have that amount of time to um, devote to one concept. But hopefully after this, you know, I've probably done about two two and a half hours of just Spivak's notion. I think that should suffice as a, as a really solid supplement to the reading itself. So read the text. Um, for all of these, read the text and then use the videos as a supplement um, to further understand the, the nuances of, of the text. With that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.